I've been teaching these quilting technique classes every month. Uh, last month, we did this um, quilt block, which I turned into a pillow. And then uh, my other quilts up on the wall there, my other block. <laughs> and then uh, this month, we're doing uh, applique, what we call raw edge applique. And here's the table runner that we're making. And um, next month, we're gonna do what we call uh, quilt as you go. So we're gonna quilt, uh, sew these strips on and quilt at the same time. And then uh, doing applique again, we'll just applique a tree on here. But you can do anything you want, snowman or Santa face. Uh, the tree was pretty simple and um, quick, so that's what I went for. <laughs> and then in January, I, I don't know, we'll maybe do some walking foot quilting on your machine, maybe uh, a how to do binding, a um, little class on that. Um, so we'll come up with some other ideas for next year. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to just make the small pumpkin today, just to show you the technique. So this is the smaller one. Kind of short and squatty. And this is the tall one. So I'm going to be making the smaller one. So I've, I've changed my um, my background fabric size and my backing and stuff like that. But the technique on how to do the applique is what we're going to focus on today. So let's look at the supplies that you'll need. Uh, of course, you'll need the, there's two templates for this pattern. This is the tall pumpkin pattern and this is the short pumpkin pattern. So I'm going to use the short one today. And for the table runner, you'll need to do <clears throat> two sets of the tall one. And then uh, my background fabric, this is what I'll be applicating the pieces to. And then I have some uh, batting. I've used fusible fleece. It's got glue on one side. And that'll iron, I'll iron that to my background or my backing, excuse me. And this is my backing. So it's going to match my table runner. But this will be, I'll cut it, I'll cut it down probably to a little mug rug and um, it'll match my table runner. Okay, and then I have my fabrics a selection of oranges. So these are the same, the same colors I used in my other, in my table runner. Got five different, there's, there's five pieces to the pumpkin, to each pumpkin. So I just picked a variety of orange prints. And then I have a, a brown and black swirly piece for my stem. And those are the same fabrics I used in my table runner. So everything it will match my table runner. The other thing you need is, um, we call it um, fusible web. <laughs> I don't know how it got that name, but it's the iron-on um, webbing, fusing. So we're going to fuse the fabric, the print fabric to the background fabric, the white. And the product that I use is the Pellon 805, which I, I, you can buy it at Walmart by the yard. So this is what it looks like. Just use by it by the yard. And one side is, you can feel is kind of bumpy. That's where the glue is. And then the other side is paper. And the paper will come off at, a, at the 
after we fuse this to our fabric, the paper comes off and then we fuse the print fabric to the background fabric. So the first step, um, there's also some, the pattern itself or the supply list, um, you know, called for, uh, what's it called for? Some kind of other printable sheets. So you can buy this type of fusible webbing in eight and a half by 11 sheets. And then you can just run, you can just print off these templates right onto your fusible. But I like to buy it by the, by the yard and then just trace it. So all I'm gonna do is lay this down on top of my printout of my pattern pieces. And then I just take a regular pencil. You could use a marker and just trace the pieces onto that. And usually this 501 is, it's lightweight. There's different um, heaviness of glue, you know, like how much glue is on the, on the fusible. This one's a lightweight. So the, the glue is pretty light. Doesn't add a lot of stiffness to your fabric. And so it's pretty thin and I can see through it well enough to trace this pattern. But if you, if you can't see through it, you could put this up on a window, just take your paper, put your paper up on, against a window, um, tape it up there and then put your fusible up on top. So I'm drawing on the paper side. And that's also important to know. So getting, uh, for this particular pattern, the um, the tracing doesn't have to be exact because none of the pieces touch each other, none of them overlap. But when you're doing um, some other patterns for raw edge applique, if they overlap at all, you want to be careful that you're you're drawing your lines pretty accurate. Otherwise, you might have a space in between that isn't uh, isn't covered up. Now I'm just drawing drawing this straight as it is. Um, a lot of times I'll I'll shift and move my paper around to to utilize the least amount of a fusible web as possible. But these are all laid out pretty close, so. That should work fine. So I'm tracing, there's five pumpkin pieces. And then there's the stem piece. So I'm just gonna shift this over and trace the stem. And again, that one doesn't overlap or touch on this pattern. But what's nice about this fusible web is you can, you know, with this paper, you could, you could print out almost any little shape or pattern that's, a, or even a coloring book, you know, just, and just trace it and make cute patterns. Okay, the other thing I would suggest um, well, they, she put a little dot up here at the top, but just so you know that that's the top of the pattern, the lady that wrote the pattern. The other thing I would recommend when I did all three of mine, especially with the two large, uh, taller pumpkins, is to label all these pieces. It's not labeled in the pattern, but it really helped me. 
So like on my table runner, so the first one, I labeled all these pieces, A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. These were all Bs and these were all Cs. That way, after I got all my pieces cut out, I knew exactly how to lay them out. So I'm just doing, I'll be consistent. So if you're doing the table runner, your first big one, tall one is A. So this one would be B. So we're gonna call it B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5. Uh, because once you get these done, they look like they, they're similar, but they may not be exactly the same. And so if you get them flipped around, this way I also know which way is up. <laughs> so if I get it flipped around later, I'll know, oh, that's going the wrong way because the, the label is upside down. Okay, so the next thing is to take paper scissors and we're gonna cut, but leave about a quarter, anywhere from an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. It really doesn't matter. But because we're gonna do all separate, uh, I'm doing different fabrics. Each piece is gonna be on different fabrics. So we need to cut these apart. So just trimming the excess around. And then in between, there's a, enough spacing between each one. You can just cut in between. This one's got a little bit of extra. So I might, I'll trim this extra off. Because any fabric that has this adhesive on it, um, I, I can't reuse it generally. So I, I end up throwing it away if it has fusible on it. So I'm just trying to get the patterns separated. Okay, so this can go in the trash. And then I'm gonna cut out my stem. Again, same thing, just leave a about a quarter inch or so around it. Okay, so I'm finished with my template. Put that aside. So I'm gonna set these out again. Okay, so now I need to decide how do I want my, what order do I want my fabrics to be in? So if you look at my table runner, I, re I used the same fabrics, but I rearranged them so that they're in different spots. Um, I kind of like the, I, I like the order of this one so I think I might follow the same, do it the same, or I could do it even totally different from all three of all three of these. So let's see, I could do, so I use this one, this one, and that one. So that leaves the plaid or the little tiny flowers. So let's do, let's do the tiny flowers in the middle. So that's going to be uh, B3. Let's do, let's do one of the outer edges. Let's do this one for five. So I'm actually, I'm making it different from all three of the other ones. So. This one was never on the outside, so I could put this one on the other side. So that'll be one. And then this one, yeah, it was never in the center, so it really doesn't matter which one I do. Put it over here for four, and then that leaves this one for number two. 
So this is gonna be my, the layout or the sequence for my fabrics. So the other thing too, is you can kind of just lay them all out here and just see if you like that order. Because depending, it's it's not gonna matter because there's space in between them, but it's also helpful to take a look at it. And I might say, well, maybe I'll put this one on this side and this one on this side. You know, so it's like, do I want this hexagon pattern next to this one or next to this one? Um, I kind of like it over here with this one next to that. I kind of like that better. So that's what I'm going to go with. So I really don't need those sitting on top, but that's the order. And a thing to remember with applique, this raw edge applique, it's not going to matter so much for our pattern because it's a pumpkin. <laughs> but, you know, say you have a, uh, a bird and you're going to applique it onto fabric. Your pattern is going to be the reverse of what it is going to look like on the front of your fabric, uh, on your final piece. So I'm going to iron these onto the back of fabric and then and then pull the paper off and then we're going to iron it onto the onto the background. So all of these are going to be flipped. So it's really going to go one, two, three, four, and five. So that's what the pumpkin will actually look like when I'm finished. So now I need to decide, well, do I want do I, do I want this this particular one on the left or the right? Well, I want it on the on the left. So that's why I labeled that one number five. So let me show you how we iron this on. I'll start with number five. Come over here to my iron. Okay, so got a little, little piece down here. It could probably fit it. I'm just getting the wrinkles out for now. And um, I thought maybe I had salvaged there, but I don't. So this is number five. So I'm just gonna see, you know, where does it fit so that I can get the whole piece out. You're also, can, if you have directional fabric or like in this, in this case, you know, there's a little bit of a, of a grid, so to speak. So just be mindful of, you know, if I cut it on an angle, I'm gonna, I might lose that grid. Maybe that's, that's good. Maybe that might be look better. But if you want that grid to be up and down on your project, then you need to make sure that your piece is also up and down. So if you have any, um, this is kind of what we call directional, but not really, because it could go upside down or it could go any, any way. But you just have to be mindful of, of what it's going to look like if you cut it. So I think I might cut it this way, do it this way. So it's kind of on an angle and I really won't see that. I'll lose that effect of the grid. I won't really see the grid. Okay, so I have it glue side down on the back of my print fabric. And then I'm just gonna take my iron and I'm just, I'm pressing. Don't slide and push it around. Just press it for a few seconds. And then we'll let that, we'll let that dry or dry, cool. <laughs> okay, so in order for this one to be next to, right next to the other one, this is gonna be number two. No, I'm sorry, four. That's five, this will be number four. <clears throat> okay, just getting the wrinkles out. 
And then I'll decide on placement. Again, I kind of like it um, on an angle. There's really no grid direction on, on this one, but it the bubbles do kind of go in a row. Okay. So that one's done. Um, the other thing I like to do sometimes when I'm working with little pieces and I've ironed them onto bigger pieces, <laughs> just trim this off. And we'll let that cool. So we're, I'm just going to trim away this piece just so I, I'm not working with gravy pieces of fabric. Okay, so I'm finished with those. Okay, this is my center. And um, every time I look at this fabric, I think I have it's directional, but in fact, <laughs> one row the flowers go up and one row the flowers go down, but there are, are stripes in there. So this one, I do want to get the stripes to go to be laying on my background. I want to fuse it down exactly uh, parallel, per, um, vertical. So I want the lines to be Nice to be straight. So I'm, I'm just going to eyeball it, but you know, it's pretty, pretty easy to see. So I, I'm not going to turn this one, you know, I'm not going to put it on an angle like this. Otherwise my lines are, go, are going to go on a diagonal once I glue it down. So just try to line that up straight, and, straight up and down on the fabric. Just trimmed it off my big piece and I'm done with my big piece. Okay, the next one is number two. Okay, so this one has a has some um, direction to it also goes in a row and then they go um, up and down. And since I'm doing a curved piece, I'm gonna actually curve it some more just so I, I don't have any really definite um, curves or, you know, um, rows to it. So I, I wanna kind of eliminate the, the look of that. By placing it on an angle, I. Well, they kind of go on <laughs> a diagonal too. So the, the lavender dots go on an angle. So just kind of, so it's really not gonna matter on this one, no matter where I put it, it's going to kind of create either a diagonal or a vertical or a horizontal. So I'm just gonna put it on a little bit of an angle. I can, I can see through and see what I'm getting. So I'm just kind of looking at what's the pattern behind it. It really doesn't matter. The print's so small, it really doesn't matter, but you can play around with that depending on what your fabric is. But definitely if you have directional fabric, you know, say flowers that go in one direction, you want to make sure that those are straight up and down. Okay, so I'm finished with that big piece. And then our last one is a little plaid. And what I thought would be fun with this pattern is to just make some, make some unusual colors. You know, I've seen a lot of painted pumpkins. They'll paint them white and purple and they don't have to be orange. <laughs> oh, that's my stem. I don't want that. So I want number one, 
Now I need to decide again, am I going to, how do I want that, that pattern in the fabric to show up on my, on my pumpkin? So I'm gonna kind of make it, it's almost gonna look like a, um, a crisscross or a hashtag um, if I go on an angle. And it also conserves the most fabric. So if I wanted it straight up and down, I'm gonna have to, you know, I'd have to kind of move it this way and figure out. But I don't know exactly how it's gonna be placed on my background, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make it straight up and down because then if it's off a little bit, if it's off a little bit, it looks weird. Looks like you you tried to get it straight, but it's not. But if you if you angle things a lot, oh yeah, that's good enough. Probably should have gone a little bit more of an angle. Could also do these in yellow. They look like bananas right now. <laughs> I thought like purple, lavender, lavender pumpkins and purple pumpkins. That would be cute. Okay, finish with that one. Now we just have our stem to do. And really isn't anything to consider on this print. It just has swirlies on it. So it really doesn't matter how I place this stem on here. Here we go. All right, so finish with this fabric. Okay, so the next step is to cut all these out. So the reason we left a little bit of we left a little bit of fusible is so that now we can cut right on the line and that'll give us nice, crisp, clean lines. And <clears throat> we know the glue goes all the way to the edge of that cut line. It's a lot harder to cut out your pieces if you, if you trim your fusible right on the line. It's hard to, you know, cut that again right on the line. So I always leave a little bit of extra, iron it down and then, and then trim to your shape by cutting right on that line. Okay. And what's nice about this pattern <clears throat> is if you wanted to make a really big enlarged pumpkin, <laughs> <clears throat> just um, just enlarge your templates that you print out. You could even separate the pattern, the template into two different two or three different sheets and enlarge them on your printer. <clears throat> uh, so you can make this any size. It's not going to. It's not going to change the the pattern. You know, some sometimes you can't enlarge patterns, but a lot of times with this raw edge applique, 
usually if you enlarge every, all your pieces the same, you know, say you do a 20% increase, if you increase all of them, you can get a bigger, a bigger pattern. And like I said, this is this is nice because you can you can trace right on that on that fusible web, or if you get the printable kind, you can just print it out on your printer, and then all you have to do is cut out your shapes and iron them down. So you could also freehand some some patterns. If you if you like to draw, you could draw your own patterns too. There, that's gonna be cute. Yeah, I like these lighter oranges. So they kind of have a, um, a a pinky, a pink tint to them. Not real dark. What's fun about this pattern too is by using different fabrics, it just give you a nice variety in your pumpkin. You could use all dark oranges or like I said, you know, try try purple. You could also make these out of all the same fabric. So say I wanted a pumpkin in this fabric. I could cut out all my pieces in this one fabric and it would still be cute because they're all separated. There's gonna be a little bit of the background showing through to separate them. So you could also, or you could do, you know, three pieces out of this same fabric. And then these two be something different. So feel free to, play around with your colors. Okay, so the next step is to iron, iron this on, fuse it down to our background. So I wanna to try to center it, try to figure out you know, exactly where I'm gonna put it. I don't want it too close to the bottom because then when I um, do my quilting, um, I'll, it'll be too close to the edge. So leave enough Leave enough border around, around it all. And then this is, you know, uh, you don't want them to spread out too much. The other thing I could do is I can go back to my, well, no, my template doesn't really. Sometimes <clears throat> there'll be a, um, a placement sheet in a pattern and it will have a guideline with all the shapes on it on exactly where to place it. But this is pretty free form, so you can kind of go uh, wherever you want. But I would try to leave about about a eighth of an inch in between each one. So mainly, I'm looking at you know where's this where's the center one landing? Do I have it straight up and down because of this striped fabric? You know I don't I want to make sure it's not crooked. So I've got it on my on my cutting mat here so I can kind of line it up with the with the edges you know is it straight up and down do I have about the same amount of fabric on the top and the bottom maybe maybe come down a little bit so you can take a ruler I've got not that much and maybe just a tad more on the top. It's better to have a little more on the top. So if I bring it down a little bit more, that would be okay too. You know, you don't want it too close to the top, otherwise it'll look like your pumpkin is floating in space. And then um, I can take a ruler also and go well to the from the center of this piece to the outer edge is five inches. 
and from the center to this edge is about five and an eighth. So I'm pretty close to center. And I'm gonna trim this background fabric at the very end after all the quilting is done. So not, doesn't have to be ex exactly, exactly right. Okay, so I'm gonna start with, with this center piece and get that glued, get that glued down and then I'll know where to pl place my other ones. So because this is the first one, I'm not gonna use my pencil. I have a, um, an iron away marker. So I'm just gonna put a little tiny line there. You might not even be able to see it. I can see it. Just put a little tiny marker, just so I know where this has to, where this is going to go, and then when I iron it down, um, I can show you. So there, you can probably see that mark, and then when you put your iron on it, it disappears. And the reason I have to do that is I didn't take my paper off and. Um, I guess I could have taken my paper off first and then placed it, but um, this is how, the way I usually do it. Oh, now my glue's not, my glue doesn't want to come off. So I'm going to hit this again with the iron. That happens sometimes and my edges are starting to get a little frayed. So I'm just going to straight. Pick that up again. Okay, so let me try this again. Just kind of bend and crease that paper and it should come away from your fabric. And today it doesn't want to do that. Okay, so when it doesn't want to do that, what I'll do is I'll just take a pin and I'm just going to score the paper. Hopefully I went through it enough. Yeah, so I've just got the paper and then I can get in there. Oh, this is not, sometimes the fusible doesn't want to co cooperate. There we go, that's better. It should just peel off real easily. And now the glue is stuck to my fabric. So I'm just trying to get the paper off my fabric. But the glue wants to pull away on some areas. And I'm not sure why it does that. Maybe I'm not putting enough heat on it. It's either not enough or it's too much. <laughs> uh, probably not enough. Get that glue to soak into the fabric real good. So just be gentle when you're pulling the paper off. And um, there, a couple frayed edges. Okay, so I've got all my, this one's frayed again. So you just wanna make sure you don't have any um, little strings coming off, that happens sometimes when you're pulling that paper off. Okay, make sure I get all my pieces off. Now I see them here, I'm gonna come over to my ironing board. Okay, so I'm gonna put it based, using my, got my marker guidelines, I'm gonna put that right back where I wanted it and then I'm going to press this down and that will iron it, fuse it, adhere it to the background fabric. My iron doesn't get, this one doesn't get super, super hot. So I might have to leave it on there a little longer. I bought a new one because my other one was so ugly. <laughs> But my old one gets so nice and hot, I might have to go back to my old one. 
Okay, let me move this over a little bit. So I can reach it better. All right, so then we just do this for all the pieces. That's one that goes on that side. B2 goes right next to it here. So I'm going to take the paper off of this one. And my glue is not sticking to the fabric. Let me just, let me just hit all of these one more time. I think maybe I didn't do it long enough. Okay, but you also want to make sure that that it's cooled down before you tried to take the the paper off. I found that the um, the glue tends to stick to the paper if it's still hot, and we want it to stick to the fabric. So I just kind of do a little crease there to bend the paper. Usually, it just pops away. Or sometimes I can get my fingernail in there just enough to get it. Okay, so I can feel on the back of the fabric, I can feel the, it's kind of a waxy feel. I can tell that the, the glue is stuck to the fabric now. Okay, so I didn't pay attention to my top. So if this was still on here, yeah. So this is my top here. So that goes up at the top and this goes down the bottom. And then just kind of um, eyeball it, get it about an eighth of an inch away from the other fabric, make sure it's laying flat, and then press it with the iron. And then number one goes on this side. This is the top. Yeah, sometimes starting at that at that bottom point causes the fabric to fray. So I'm gonna try to start in the center here. Yeah, my glue still is coming off on my paper. So again, just, you know, just be gentle um, pulling this off. You might get some fraying, but it's kind of kind of cute with the with the raw edge applique when you have little frayed pieces. But if you if you don't want these little frayed pieces on your piece, then just 
just trim it. Just trim it before you iron it down. That looks good. Okay, well, I destroyed that paper, so I'm just going to try to figure out which way it goes by looking at the templates. This one, it probably could almost go either way, but but that's the top. So just play around with the placement till it looks good. There we go. So we got those two sides done. Let's do the next one over here. Let's see if I can start this in the middle. Yeah, I usually don't have, sorry, I usually don't have this much trouble with, with this um, fusible. There, that's better. The glue stayed on the fabric. Helps to have fingernails. <laughs> if not, just take a little pin you can kind of poke in under that paper with your pin, get it started, and then you can grab it with your, with your fingers. Just run the pin underneath the paper. See the glue, one, glue is sticking to the paper again. There we go. So my glue came up a little bit, so I'm just going to fold it over so it's back on the back of the fabric. I've got one little frayed piece. There we go. All right. So I want to kind of mirror this other one. So I kind of look at, you know, where is it placed? They're about the same shape. So I um, want them to be kind of similar. Again, about an eighth of an inch. Um, I, I noticed when I was making the my table runner that they don't match up exactly. So they're a little bit there's a little bit more space in the center than there is at the top and the bottom. So don't worry about that if yours turns out that way too. That's just the way the pattern's written. All right. All right, so I'm looking for a straight of grain on the fabric and that, that will reduce the raveling. Oh, it just doesn't wanna, doesn't wanna pop up like it normally does. Yeah, this one's really sticking to the paper again. So when it sticks to the paper, what I do is just kind of, with my fingernail, um, grab the glue, kind of push the glue back down on the fabric as I'm pulling the paper off. Oh, man. 
This is like the worst one. <sighs> now that I've <laughs> pulled some of the pa paper off, I have to be careful not to touch that glue with my iron. Let's see if that helps. Yeah, that helped. Uh, still not coming off. So the problem I'm having is that if the glue doesn't stick to the fabric, then the fabric is not going to stick to the background. So I want to make sure that it's sticking to the fabric. We are going to sew around the outer edges, but we still want glue on the fabric in, you know, in the center in between, so it stays glued down to the background. Okay, yeah, I just don't think I, <clears throat> I don't think I put enough heat on it long enough, because when I just redid that, that helped. All right, I got a couple little frayed edges, just gonna trim that. And if there's any glue coming over the edge, just fold that back over top and put it on the fabric side. But the neat thing about this raw edge is that uh, a lot of people like, like the frame that it gives over time. So once we get this all finished, you know, if it if it was a quilt that we would, you know, maybe wash a few times <laughs> or wash a bunch, over time those the the glued edges would come up and you'd get a little bit of fraying, which is kind of cute, you know, gives it a little rustic look. Um, so nothing wrong with some frayed edges. Just for now, I I don't really want them because I want to be able to stitch around the edges first. Okay, so I'm looking for placement again to see how that's all balanced. You know, I don't want it too high. Bring it down a little bit maybe. So I'm just kind of viewing the bottom of my pumpkin to make sure it looks like it's straight across. My spacing is good there. All right, I think that's it. Now just the sam and then we can start stitching. There we go. Okay, and again, I'm just gonna place this. So it's about anywhere between an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch away, probably closer to eighth of an inch. And you can turn it a little bit, angle it. So just play around with it until you like the placement. Trash <laughs> out of the way. 
Okay, so now for stitching, we have a few different options. And on my table runner, I did what's called a, a blanket stitch. Oh, let's see, I'm not sure you'll be able to see it. Maybe on this one, <clears throat> but I, I can kind of draw it. Uh, I'll draw it out for you on this paper. So I'll make it kind of large so you can see it better. So this is the edge of your pumpkin piece. And a blanket stitch basically goes forward and then it comes over and catches your fabric, it goes forward, catches your fabric, forward, over, over, over. <coughs> so that's a blanket stitch. <coughs> now I try to get my, I try to get this stitch to go right up against the fabric. So, and I left a little space there so you could see the stitch, but. <coughs> so let's do that and then I'll use, I'll use blue. So I try to follow just on the edge of the fabric. <coughs> so that would be the blanket stitch. You could also just use a zigzag. And that would go just right on the edge or uh, I like to do mine on the edge like that. So this is, this is my fabric over here. This is my fabric and then I'm stitching on the printed fabric on the applique. Uh, some people will zigzag right over, right over top and go into the background a little bit, but you end up seeing this stitch if the fabric is if the background fabric is a different color which it typically is so i like to do zigzag just on the inside there if it goes over just a tad it's okay um another option is just a state a straight stitch <coughs> so this is your this is your printed fabric here, your pumpkin piece. And they'll do, they'll do a straight stitch just inside, just inside the edge. So maybe about an eighth of an inch, a 16th of an inch, something like that. And that's what I did, let's see if you can see on my tree pillow here. <clears throat> So I just did a straight stitch, kind of like what we call a top stitch. And I just followed the edge because this is, it's a table runner or, you know, I'm making a mug rug now. And this pillow, you know, it's not gonna be washed a lot. And if it is, if this does start to fray, it will just be cute. <laughs> um, so a straight stitch, especially when you have bigger pieces that you're applicating, that works really well too. That's really cute. <clears throat> the zigzag is really nice. And um, on my table runner, I did the blanket stitch. <clears throat> I almost always use the blanket stitch when I applique. Okay. But I think for our demo today, I'm just gonna use a uh, straight stitch. So I'm just gonna follow the edge of the fabric and just do a straight line stitching. So even if you have an older machine and you don't have zigzag on it, you can still do applique. Especially with this fusible method because it's fused down. It's not, it's not going anywhere. <clears throat> All right, so I have orange thread, orange thread on my machine because, let me move this up a little bit, because I want, the, I want the thread to blend into the edge of the applique, um, into my piece. I don't want it to, to stand out. Now, there are some cases where 
you might want to use contrasting thread. <clears throat> so you <clears throat> so your stitching does show up. That's cute also on certain patterns. Okay, let's see. I put some tape here to kind of block the light. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing, but now I can't see where I'm sewing. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to do is hold my hold my top stitch. And I'm going to start somewhere where it's not so noticeable. So maybe down at the bottom. And I'm lining up my fabric under my presser foot. So I'll end up with about a 16th of an inch from the edge. So I'm going to do needle down and needle up. And I'm going to pull that bobbin thread up to the top. Just catch it with your fingers. Now I've got both threads up at the top and I'm going to push them out of the way. That way they don't get all tangled up on the back side. And now I'm going to do needle down again. And <coughs> I'm going to use a little bit of a bigger stitch on this because um, it does show up. But if you had small pieces with a lot of turns and curves and stuff, a smaller stitch helps you go around the curves. So I'm on my machine, I'm at 2.5. That's kind of my default when I turn my machine on. So I'm just gonna take it real slow, especially uh, on the curves. And now I'm coming up to the, that pointy end. So I'm just working my way down to the, the bottom until I get um, about, a sixteenth of an inch from the other edge. So now I'm going to sew along the other edge. So because I'm sewing a curve, I'm going to have to stop and pivot my fabric just a little bit. You don't want to be yanking on your fabric like this because then it will distort it and you might uh, and your piece might not lay flat. So I always like to sew a couple stitches, stop my needles down, lift the presser foot and rotate the fabric. So I'm kind of have a, a section where I'm gonna be able to sew straight again along the edge. Okay, I can't see through my presser foot very well. All right, maybe one more stitch. And this one's not very wide at the top, so I'm just going to do a total spin around and come back down the other side. So another tip is the straight stitch is probably the fastest way to stitch down your abouche also. <clears throat> now, if you want, um, if you're not sure which one you want to use, um, I'm gonna uh, backstitch just a couple little stitches here to backstitch to tie that off. So if you're not sure about which one you wanna use, uh, make, make just a couple little test pieces and, um, and they could just be rectangles or strips and then try some of the stitches on your machine. Um, my, the one I call a blanket stitch is actually called pin stitch on my machine. Oh, hold, excuse me just a minute, my dog is, at the door. Mommy, you gotta go back down. Go lie 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 down.
Oh, sorry about that. If I don't let her outside, she'll sit there and whine for an hour. So just went ahead and let her outside. Um, yeah, so just do a test piece. You know, I, I kind of like the straight stitch on this one because it does give a nice, um, nice smooth edge to it. But I also, I like the, um, the blanket stitch on this one. It really, the blanket stitch really kind of disappears into the fabric. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Uh, like I said, I like to start more towards the bottom where you're not gonna, you're not gonna see the stitching, the overlap when you end, there's some overlap. Okay, get my thread pulled up out of the way. That one kind of came to a point. And then when, um, when I've sewn away from that starting thread, I, I clip that off so it doesn't get in my way later. Okay, so that one came to a point, so I was just able to pivot and start down the other side. This one has just a little bit of a width to it at the top. Uh, no, that probably that probably wasn't enough room. So I'm going to back it up just a little bit. There we go. Went too close to the edge. <laughs> So let's talk about like troubleshooting. Well, you know, so say you're stitching along here and you accidentally run off the edge and your, your stitching is not on your fabric. Just keep going, go all the way around and finish and then go back and pick up um, where you started to veer off and start at that point and just stitch out, stitch it over again. Just do another stitch. It won't be noticeable. You just need to make sure you do a, a back stitch at the beginning and the end so that the thread doesn't come out. Okay, there's the second one. Now this third one, um, we've got really four definite edges to it. So we'll have some some turns to do on that. So again, pulling my thread up, pushing it out of the way, needle down. So I don't back stitch at the beginning because I know I'm going to overlap when I come back to the end at the end and I'll back stitch at the end. So this one has a real gentle curve to it. So I can turn it a little bit, but just make sure you're not making your fabric go wonky. Oops, when it starts to go wonky, that's when I, I stop and reposition. Uh, maybe one more. There we go. That's good. So say you get to a, a corner and you overshot the edge. You can uh, either do a back stitch or do your needle up and then and just slide your fabric to reposition where you're sewing.
because when when it's all said and done, you're really not going to notice this stitching. So don't be too worried about how it looks. You just want to make sure that you're catching all the edges. So say say I ran off the edge here. Well, I could just come back to this corner and do a new stitch where I do catch the fabric. And you then you could you could pick out your first stitching, or you could just leave it in there. It wouldn't even probably be noticeable. Okay, so this time I'm going to start over here on this edge. My thread up. Needle down. Okay, so if your machine is an older machine, I've got a, well, it's not even an old, really an old machine. It's just a basic uh, singer and it doesn't have the needle down. So you can still do applique and just turn your, um, you know what your, your flywheel is. Um, you just turn the wheel until your needle is in, into the fabric into and and then lift your presser presser foot up because if you don't do needle down let me back this up a little bit because i almost ran off the edge um because if you try to shift your fabric and your needle's not down uh, you're gonna you're gonna you have a chance a risk most likely i know i would <laughs> i would move my fabric and now i'm not sewing straight anymore i wouldn't be on my my existing sew line so you'd end up with a, a zigzaggy wonky stitch okay this one had a little bit of fabric width at the bottom. So I did one stitch to get over to the edge. And now I'm just aiming for my other sew line to start. A few stitches back and we're done. Okay. Start on this side. And you can really start anywhere, no particular reason. I just don't, I don't like to start it in the, in the points. That makes it hard to start and, and end. So just anywhere along the edge. Okay, this one comes to a fairly narrow point. So I'm gonna sew up to the point. So I wanna make sure that I anchor the very tip of that. And I'm just basically gonna pivot all the way around. And a couple stitches might be right on top of each other, but that's okay. Now, as I get down further, um, just following the edge of that fabric. Now sometimes it'll turn real easily, but you don't want to force it on those curves. Okay, this one's kind of skinny at the bottom too, so I just want to make sure I go all the way to the tip, pivot. Okay, I'm coming up on my, uh, I can't, I can't see it, the thread matches so well. <laughs> there it is, okay. 
So I guess it doesn't matter if I match if I match them up or not. <laughs> you know, can we all see it? The thread colors, the same colors, this fabric. Okay. Now we have the stem to do. And now the question is, do I keep the orange or do I switch to brown? And let's see, it's probably not dark enough. Oh, I know I have a dark, oh, here it is. So I do have this darker brown. So I am going to switch out just my top thread because that's what you'll see on the top. But you don't have to, you could keep it orange um, or you maybe you did your whole pumpkin in, in green or maybe you did your, it all in, in cream color or white. Take my tape off here. I have a tape on there to kind of block the light a little bit so you can see better. But just takes a few seconds to rethread the top. You just and uh, so now I'm going to I'm going to start down along this bottom maybe. Yeah, I think that's where else. Uh, maybe I'll start there. Doesn't matter. Again, pull my thread through, needle down, get it thread out of my way, and then just keep going. I remember growing up, my mom taught me how to sew, and I hated to change thread color, so I would just sew with whatever was in the machine. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, but now, now I've, I'm used to changing, threading my machine, so I, I don't mind it so much. It's funny. So maybe you're like me when I was a kid. I don't want to change the thread. I don't want to have to thread the machine. Okay, that's a little... Well, I guess I think it'll be okay. It's a little close to the edge, but it caught it enough. You don't, if you get too close to the edge, it could, the fabric could fray when you wash it and come, totally come out of your stitching. So, um, you know, down the road, if that happens, after you wash it, if you wash this table runner, <laughs> um, Usually for the table runners, they don't get that dirty. You can just take a, a damp cloth and just kind of, or e even just a dry cloth and just dust it off. A lot of times that's all you need is to remove the dust. But if you wash it and the fabric comes out of the, out of the stitching, um, I would just take a thread and needle and just stitch it back down, just going through the top layer. Uh, because once it's quilted, it, it'd be hard to sew it on your machine again. All right, so a little back stitch there, and we are finished with the stitching. How cute is that? I just love these colors. Okay, move mm -hmm. my machine over a little bit. All right, so the next step. <clears throat> is to make our little quilt sandwich. So you're gonna have your table runner, you're gonna have your great big piece, but it's the same, the same uh, steps as what I'm gonna to show today. So we have our backing, we have a, a batting that goes in between, and then we have our, our top layer. So if you've done any quilting, it's basically the same thing. So I'm using the same backing fabric, I kind of cut it out so it said pumpkin and spice, everything nice. So I'm going to put my, uh, I'm using 
like I said, I'm using fusible wet, uh, fusible fleece. It's called fusible fleece. It's like a, it's almost like a felt batting and it has glue on one side. So we wanna make sure the glue side is down on the, on the backing. And I actually like to do it this way with, I don't like to iron on directly on the, on the fusible fleece. It is um, polyester, so it doesn't take heat very well. So you could melt it if your iron's too hot. So in order, the goal is to melt the glue and not the fleece. So I like to put my fleece down first, my batting, and then put the backing fabric over top of it. And you can also, um, I didn't bring my, my pressing cloth over, but I have, um, I have some paper. Uh, it's like parchment paper. Parchment paper will work, or you can buy a pressing cloth. Uh, uh, it's a Teflon pressing cloth and the glue won't stick to that. So if I have an edge of my, of this glue that's um, hanging over the batting, if I put my iron over top of that, it's gonna to stick to my iron. So I'm just checking, um, it pretty much covers everything. I've got a little bit of an edge over here, but you're just going to iron this fusible fleece onto your backing fabric. So I'm just going up to the edge here because there's a little bit of an overlap. And what's nice about this new iron is it does have a really pointy um, front and it has a straight line on the front. So I can get right into that corner and not, uh, and not even touch that fleece. So I don't know if you can see here. So see this edge of the of the iron is really straight. So I can just I can go right up to the edge with that. I don't have to worry about this side because it's covered. The fusible is covered. So you just want to check, make sure it's sticking. If you grab your your backing and lift up, and it's really not overlapping that much. I probably wouldn't even get any glue on me. So you just want to make sure that it, it, it stuck down. This is just basically um, a temporary hold because I'm going to actually do some quilting on this piece. Now for today's demo, let's see how we're doing on time. We've got about 30 minutes left. So I'm not going to do a ton of quilting just because it takes time, but Here's my, my quilt sandwich, we call it. <laughs> so, oh, I wanna check my backing. Oh yes, not that it matters, but I want my backing right side up compared to the front. It really doesn't matter because you're not gonna see both of them at the same time. Okay. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of quilting. I'll maybe do some some quick loops, some big loops around around the pumpkin. <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to trace um, kind of what we call echo. I'm just going to stitch right uh, probably about an eighth of an inch from the pumpkin strips, and then I'm going to do a stitch in between each one of these. Um, so let's do the straight line. So this is all gonna be with my walking foot. And then if I do loops, maybe I'll just do some straight lines going down too. Um, because then I would have to change my foot to do free motion quilting. But for the echo and it going in between, I'm going to use just um, my regular foot. Or if you have a walking foot, 
that is useful. But my machine has this thing down here called, uh, it's called dual, it's a dual um, integrated dual feed dogs. <laughs> um, so it's this piece back here is pulling the top fabric through and the feed dogs on the bottom are pulling the fabric through from the bottom. So in order to kind of even that out, um, the manufacturers of FOF, they added this um, little feed dog to the top. But you can also buy a walking foot, which has two feed dogs that will pull the top of your fabric together. So what, what that does is it allows you, when you've got, when you've got two fabrics that you're sewing and you've got batting in between, the feed dogs are pulling at the bottom and the presser foot's kind of pressing on the top. And so what ends up happening is the top fabric doesn't feed through at the same rate as the bottom and your fabric ends up shifting. Usually not a lot, but with quilting, it's enough to kind of wrinkle your quilt, might wrinkle up <coughs> the, um, the, the top of your quilt. So, so it's good to have walking foot <coughs> or to do free motion quilting. Also at the top of my, on the top of my machine here, let's see if you can see it. <coughs> I also like to loosen the pressure on my presser foot so that it's not pressing down as hard. So um, if you have a lot of layers, if it presses down real hard, it's more likely to shift those layers. Okay, um, take my tape off again, sorry. Now let's talk about thread for doing the quilting. So late, uh, lately on a couple quilts, I've gone with like a light colored thread. So normally with a background, you would match your background so the quilting doesn't show up. But I have found that by just using a pale color, so this one, it's like a, uh, it's, it's a really, really pale peach and it doesn't add a ton of contrast. So for example, if I quilted with, if I quilted with a, this orange, it would really show up on the background. And I, I normally don't want my quilting to show up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, where is that color? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I think this is it. So, um, so see how, see how my, my fabrics, they have a, um, kind of a pink tone to them. So I ended up using this really pale pink or this light pink uh, thread and it just worked out really well. You can see, you can see the, you can see it, but it's not really bold, and it just adds texture to the quilting. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch my top thread to this color. Miss Drake, come in. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Can you uh, can you quilt it? Can you uh, mute yourself, please? Okay, so get this thread in.
Okay, so all I'm going to do to start is to um, echo around like I did on my table runner. I just did about an eighth of an inch away from the pumpkin and then in between each one. I didn't do any quilting on these individual pieces because I wanted them to kind of stand out. If I quilt on them, it will kind of push it down and they won't stand out. And because, um, because they're fairly small, the widest piece, I, the light, widest stitching I have is about maybe two and a half inches. And that's adequate. You don't need more than that on this particular batting. <coughs> so same thing, um, let me start closer to the bottom here. Just the overlap isn't as noticeable down there. So I'm going to pull my thread from the bottom up just so it doesn't get tangled up. Needle down. Now I'm going to increase my stitch just a little bit. Just when I'm quilting, I like having a little bit of a bigger stitch. Um, a real tiny stitch kind of tends to uh, gather the fabric up and it looks too, um, too matted or too, oh, I don't know. It just looks better <laughs> if it's a bigger stitch, I think. Um, but again, do a test on a piece of sample fabric. You'll make yourself a little practice sandwich and do some different stitches. Um, there's a lot of decorative stitches on your machine that might be cute in, um, in, in quilting, just some straight line quilting. So I'm just gonna go around, basically um, echoing the shape of the pumpkin on the outside. And all this is doing is, um, this is the quilting part. If, if you guys haven't quilted before, this is the quilting part where we assemble all the three pieces together. So on, on some of the more uh, gentler um, curves, you could maybe just by putting your hands on your fabric, you might be able to guide it around the curve, but around the stem here, this is pretty, it's a pretty um, big curve. So I'm going slow and turning my fabric every couple stitches. But on the curves that are a little bit straighter, you can maybe go, you can maybe guide it just with your hands. Because this, this quilt sandwich is, is pretty well quilted together. But remember your top piece, your top, nothing's holding the top piece on. So you want to make sure that you're um, holding this down. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll even use my I have some quilting gloves that I'll put on that have some rubberized fingers and that just kind of helps hold everything. <coughs> so I'm not having to work so hard with my, my fingertips. Okay, so coming around to the my starting point. So I'm gonna clip that off. Okay, so let's see. So a couple options. I could just keep going here. I don't know if you guys can even see this. <laughs> Might be too bright. 
here, turn my light off for a second. So I could keep going until I get to the end of this one and just travel up in between these two, or I could tie off my thread and start all over again down here, come up, cut over, come down, <coughs> cut over, come up, cut over, and come back down. So I think I'll I'll think I'll just do that. I'm just going to just going to travel around where I already stitched. until I come to that first gap. And uh, again, you're stitching, you know, don't worry about where you're stitching. Just, um, just do the best you can. Um, it's really not gonna be noticeable once you're done with the whole thing of, oh, was this stitch, you know, too close or too far away? You really won't see it once the whole thing is finished. So I'm just traveling up in between those two just to quilt that empty space. Okay, so I also want, I want a line of stitching, quilting all the way underneath the stem. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna, I'm going to come back over here. Uh, I turned my machine off, so I want to make sure I get back right in the same spot. There we go. I'm going to go up one more. So I'm going to come over to this edge first. And I'm just going to go up to that outline stitch and, and then I'm going to turn around and go back. So I'm just following the edge of the stem right now, just to quilt that space. <laughs> you might stitch over parts of it later, but that's okay. And I'm just going quilting all the way to the other edge. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack a little bit to get to this open space. Maybe one more. There we go. Okay, so that's gonna come right down the center of that opening or that space that's in between those two pieces. <laughs> Okay, so now I met up with that outline stitching. So I'm just going to follow that until I get to this next opening. <laughs> I don't know if that helps at all. Okay, so I'm going to come up this opening. This one's a little bit wider, so I've got plenty of room to stitch in between until I get to the top. So I'm just trying to go right down the center of that of that space until I hook up with the outline stitch at the top. And then I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm just gonna retrace that sew line <clears throat> where, <clears throat> excuse me, where I went around the stem. Okay, now I'm, I'm in, I'm lined up to come down this one and that's the last one. Cause we did this, we did the first one <clears throat> right after we did the outline.
Okay, I'm going to, um, I'm joined up with my outline stitch and that's where I'm gonna do my, <clears throat> my back stitch to tie off the thread. There we go. Excuse me. <clears throat> so because I left the darker thread on the bobbin, I can actually see it better on the backing. <clears throat> and then there's the quilted part on the front. So <clears throat> the next step would be to decide if I'm what I'm going to do to quilt in the open spaces. And um, I like to do just some we call that meandering or just, just some open quilting, you know, nothing really specific. <clears throat> um, because we don't want to, you know, put something in here that's going to take away from our, our pattern, our pumpkin. We just want something to hold the pieces together. So I think, I think a few uh, loop-de-loops or some uh, stippling uh, would work fine. Um, I just did, I did pretty small loops on this one, on the table runner, because <clears throat> I wanted a dense quilting, uh, denser, I mean more stitching in the background, and then that allows the pumpkin part that doesn't have as much stitching, quilting on it, that makes that really pop out, but yeah, so I'd like, so I'm going to do some of those loop-de-loops, I, that I just call them loop-de-loops, but I'm gonna do them a little bit bigger <clears throat> so it doesn't take us quite as long. We have about um, almost 15 more minutes. So I'll get started on that. I might not finish it, but I might. <laughs> and then the next thing, um, I didn't, didn't think we'd have time to do binding, but let's talk just a minute on binding just in case. So once I have all the quilting finished, I would, I would square up my block um, or my quilt, square it up, your quilt, your table runner. So I had cut this to be about, <clears throat> it's about 10 and a half inches. So I'll probably trim it down to, uh, if it, if I, if I can do 10 and a half inches, I will, but sometimes the quilting, the quilting will, will pull in the fabric a little bit. So it might be, might be um, 10 and a quarter, I'll trim it down or even 10 inches. And so let's assume this one, this side's pretty straight, but assuming <clears throat> I trim down this side, then um, for simple projects like this, I like to just machine, do machine binding. And what I would do is um, I, I do, two and a quarter inch strips and then fold it in half and then take the raw edge and put that on the back against the edge of the quilt and you would sew down this side and so I'll I'll stick a couple pins in there to pretend like we sewed it or at least one there we go yeah I could do two So that's, that would be, you know, so it'd be sewn on the back and then I press it this way and roll it to the front. <laughs> now, because I use pins, it's not, it's not going to roll very well. So I would roll it to the front and then with the machine and the same color, I would use matching thread and just stitch it down on the edge on the front. <clears throat> and let me show you on my table runner what that looks like. So you can see where I wrapped the binding around to the front and just did a top stitch along the edge there. 
The traditional way of doing binding on quilts is to sew to the front, uh, machine stitch to the front, and then turn it to the back and hand stitch it with needle and thread to the back. But on these smaller projects, it's just fine to do um, machine machine binding. And a lot of people do machine binding, especially if they're making a baby quilt and um, the quilt's gonna be washed a lot. The machine stitching will hold up better than the hand stitching. Okay, so I'm going to change out to my free motion foot. <clears throat> so you may have um, this type of foot for your machine. It's called a darning foot sometimes um, in your in your manual, might be called a darning foot. My next machine is going to just have <laughs> a, a lever I can push <laughs> to remove this stuff. I mean, to do this screw is a little bit difficult. Okay, just making sure it's on there good and tight. And then with, um, here, I'm just going to slide this up. So with free motion quilting, you need to drop your feed dogs. Here's the button for my feed dogs. So I just move this over. And now my feed dogs drop down. So when I slide my quilt sandwich underneath there, it, the feed dogs won't catch it at all. It won't get caught on the feed dogs. The feed dogs are not going to work now. And so what I'm doing with free motion quilting is I'm moving the fabric to quilt it instead of having the machine pull the fabric through. <clears throat> the other thing I like to use is this um, Supreme slider. And it's um, just real slippery <laughs> and it helps, it helps us move the fabric around. So it covered up my bobbin thread, so I'm going to pull up my bobbin thread again. And mine is a little bit dusty, so it's not sticking real well. Uh, probably should have washed it. Let's see if I've got any, I think I've got a paper towel here. So if these, um, they get, they pick up dust and dirt and I haven't, I haven't used mine in a bit since I made my table runner. So I just spray it with water and then wipe it off. Okay, a lot better. So that should stick now. Yeah, a lot better. Still wants to come up over there. Okay, so th now the first question is, where do I start? So I like to start just off on the side. Put my tape back here, see if that blocks some of the light. There we go. 
Um, I can't, I can't see though, sorry. So I like to start off on the edge and then work my way in. So I can, uh, I don't have to worry about knots and, you know, tying off my thread. So same as the applique before, I want to pull up my bobbin thread just so it's on the top and it doesn't get sewn into some of the other stitches on the bottom. Okay, so you still put your pressure foot down, but this foot doesn't put any pressure on your fabric and I can still move it all around. And that's, I just uh, don't know how to block that light. And I can't turn it off. Otherwise, um, my machine won't work. <laughs> But now I can't see. Let's see if that'll work. Okay. So I always do needle down. And now I'm ready to start stitching. So I'm just going to do some loops. I'm going to go loop this way and then loop that way. And that's the key to doing this pattern is to, is to have the loops going in different ways. Put my quilting gloves on. I bought some new ones, but they're out in my other, in the other room. So I'm gonna wear my old ones. They're a little bit dirty. <laughs> so just ignore the dirt. It, it, it's just the way they get. It doesn't come off on the fabric. And I've tried washing them and it doesn't come off either. I, I think because it's plastic basically. But that gives me some better grip and I can move my I'm going to do a little bit bigger ones on this one, just so it won't take quite as long. So I've worked myself into a corner there. So what I'm going to do is just um, come around. I'm on the edge, so I'm just going to bring my bring it around to the other edge. So just stitching in the very edge of that fabric. Okay, so now I'm going to do uh, the loops going up this side, and then I can go around to the top. Okay, hold on. Foot got stuck there for a second. Oh. My foot caught the top of the fabric, so I'm going to have to take those stitches out. Don't be afraid of using your seam ripper. It's just part of the process. All right, let me start on top of that now so it doesn't catch. Here we go. There we go. I backed up too much and caught it. Okay, you just have to stop every once in a while and reposition your hands. And the goal here is, is to make these random. So they're not, um, they're not all the same size. They're not all the same direction. And they're spread out on your quilt. I usually have a little bit more to work with on the edges, but I, I trim this one up pretty close. Okay. I'm just gonna run off the edge there and 
and stop, and then I can come back and pick it up over here. Make sure you have needle down. There. That's all I'm going to do for this one. Um, just quick and simple. Uh, it's a smaller piece, so I didn't have to be, you know, as as finicky as I was on the table runner. Um, get my threads out of there. And um, we're right at the top of the hour. So, um, you know, I kind of showed you the, I uh, showed you the, the binding basics. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos on, on how to do binding too. So um, you can, you can make your binding wider, but uh, I think you can see based on the angle of my light, you can see the texture. So it just, you just want some quilting in there to hold the pieces together. And because I left the darker, thread on the back you can you can see it a little bit so it's kind of it's cute I love it that's gonna look great with my uh, that's gonna look great with my table runner <laughs> and then uh, like I said uh, next month we're doing the quilt as you go pillow so you need about um, I, I've got I'll have the fabric requirements in the supply list ready um, probably this weekend. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15. I used about 15 strips in mine, but depending on how wide your strips are and how big you wanna make your pillow. This is a 16 by 16. And, um, and then I just used the same green fabric on the back to make the pillow. And it's just the overlap method and you know just applicate that down just like we did the pumpkin today <laughs> 